After her fury against Zhao and Kumi had abetted, Roxana began to worry about Yezad. He enjoyed Papa's company and sense of humor, sure, but family get-togethers only occurred at modest intervals, lasted a few hours, nothing so demanding like three weeks of bedbound convalescence. Hope Yezad won't mind, said Nariman. He won't. Could Papa really read her thoughts, as he used to claim when she was a child? She moistened his face with a wet towel and dried it. Grandpa, you smell like Murad does after playing cricket, said Jangir, wrinkling his nose. Don't be rude, said his mother. Nariman smiled. I've been clean bold. Or maybe it was leg before wicket. She apologized that there was not enough water for a full sponge bath, and promised to save a bucket for tomorrow. I told you this morning, don't force me to take a bath, said Jangir. Oh, so you knew Grandpa was coming? Boy is getting too. Smart, Papa. Good thing you're here to straighten him out. Come. On, you, stop laughing, get the talcum for Grandpa. He was back in an instant with the tin of synthal powder, watching as his mother eased o the stale shirt and sudra. Grandpa's skin hung loose on his arms and abdomen. On his chest it formed two pouches, shriveled breasts. Two little balloons from which all air had escaped. The hair on them like wisps of white thread. Roxana crumpled the sudra to wipe the sweat from her father's back and armpits. She shook powder from the tin and rubbed briskly, again lamenting the lack of water. Then she shed a clean sudra and shirt from the jumble in the suitcase and helped him into them. Thank you. I feel fresh as a daisy. You won't say that if you meet our ground or daisy, Papa, the way she sweats when practicing violin. She took the smelly clothes from the room, setting them aside in a pail for tomorrow's laundry. Chelo, lunchtime. I've made some light soup cheval for Jihangu's upset tummy, you can share that. She led a plate for her son and called him to the table, her father's helping was in a bowl. Easier for you, Papa. I'll hold it if you like. He put his hands out to receive the food and rested its weight on his stomach. The corn hour patterned bowl rose and fell with his breathing. It moves like a boat, Grandpa, observed Jangir. Your stomach is making waves for it. So long as no one gets seasick, said Nariman, barely avoiding a spill as he raised a spoonful to his lips. Did Kumi forget your medicine this morning? asked Roxana. I took my pill, he murmured, surrendering the bowl and spoon. It's been a lot of exertion for one day, that's all. Tomorrow will be any. Jangir came and stood by the settee. After watching for a moment, he said he wanted to feed Grandpa. It's not a game. Eat your lunch before it gets cold. He polished oh the rice and soup in his plate and was back at the bedside. Now can I? Nariman made a small gesture with his head for Roxana to let him. She handed over the food. But I'm warning you, be careful, Grandpa's just put on a clean shirt. Yes, mummy. And don't try to stew his mouth, the way you do yours. Yes, mummy, he sighed with weary exasperation. I know Grandpa chews slowly, I've seen his teeth. The unhung washing was waiting on the balcony. She shook out the clothes, fretting about the wrinkles already settled in the fabric, and kept glancing inside the room to make sure Jihangu was behaving himself. The balcony door framed the scene, nine-year-old happily feeding seventy-nine. And then it struck her like a revelation, of what, she could not say. Hidden by the screen of damp clothes, she watched, clutching Yezid's shirt in her hands. She felt she was witnessing something almost sacred, and her eyes refused to relinquish the precious moment, for she knew instinctively that it would become a memory to cherish, to recall in decult times when she needed strength. Jangir led the spoon again and raised it to his grandfather's lips. A grain of rice strayed, lingering at the corner of his mouth. Jangir took the napkin to gently retrieve it before it fell. And for a brief instant, Roxana felt she understood the meaning. Of it all, of birth and life and death. My son, she thought, my father, and the food I cooked. A lump came to her throat, she swallowed. Then all that was left of the moment were the tears in her eyes. She wiped them away, surprised, smiling, for she did not know when they had sprung, or why. There was contentment on Papa's face, and a look of importance on Jihangu's, relishing the responsibility of his task. And both had a sparkle of mischief in their eyes. Just a little bit left, Grandpa. Let's do an airplane. Okay, but careful. First of all, Biggies is climbing into the plane, said Jangir, ling up the spoon. Now the cockpit is closed. He started revving and announced the chocks were O, oh, they were ready for take-o. The spoon taxied several times round the bowl and was airborne. After a straight ascent it began to swoop and swerve, banking sharply and looping the loop. Prepare for landing, Grandpa. Nariman opened his mouth wide. The spoon entered, he clamped down on it, and the food was safely unloaded. Last one now, said Jangir, scraping the bowl clean. Ready? This time the aerial acrobatics were more ambitious. Bombs away. Rice spilled down Nariman's chin and throat and collar. Roxana rushed in from the balcony, still clutching Yezid's crumpled shirt. I warned you. Not for V.E. minutes, can you behave yourself? My fault, chuckled Nariman. I didn't open properly. Don't encourage the boy, Papa, he'll go from bad to worse. You should be strict with him. She asked if he wanted the basin for a gargle, he was meticulous about his dentures after every meal. From the way he declined, she knew that he was trying to save her the extra work. What's next on the agenda, he asked Jangir. You fed me lunch, I could help with your homework. My lessons are not on the agenda, he laughed, delighting in. The new word. Mummy's big bed is on the agenda, I'll lie in it and... Read my book. You could read here, aloud, so I can enjoy as well. Jangir hesitated, reading aloud was something he did twice a year only, for the reading and recitation exam. 
I've already niched three chapters. And you won't like it, it's just a children's story, Enid Blyton. No matter, you can continue with chapter four. If I'm bored, I'll tell you, I promise. So Jangir and Nariman learned in chapter four that George, for some day ants in the earlier pages, was now sulking in her room where she had been sent by her father, who, to make things more decult, insisted on calling her Georgina, she hates her name, he interrupted to tell his grandfather, she's a tomboy. Julian, Dick, and Anne, who were visiting for the halls, their George's cousins, he explained quickly, felt that Uncle Quentin was being rather beastly to poor old George. And how rotten for her not to be out with them, walking along the shore, especially. Since the weather was simply topping, and the sea was such a smashing shade of blue that morning, Cerulean, said Grandpa, like the sky, and Jangir repeated, Cerulean, while Timmy, whose gorgeous tail just wouldn't stop wagging, ran beside them, having a jolly old time examining every rock and shell, barking in fright at a frightened crab and making them all laugh, only it wasn't much fun laughing without good old George Anne. His mother touched him lightly on the shoulder. He looked up. She put a inger to her lips and pointed to the settee. Grandpa was asleep. Her father and her son were still sleeping when she lit the stove and made tea at 3.30, dropping the leaves directly into the kettle of boiling water. Afternoon tea did not merit the teapot and cozy she used in the morning. And when she thought about her routine, crystallized into domestic perfection over the years, she found it odd because morning was the hectic time, the leisurely ritual would have better suited the afternoon. But it was worth the trouble for Yezid's sake, he loved mornings. He loved the breakfast hour, the radio playing, and the bustle in the Adden building, and in the street below where the vendors sang out their wares, alert to summoning customers who gained their attention by clapping or producing that special staccato hiss. Sometimes Yezid imitated the vendors' songs and chants, and then the boys competed to see who could do better. She listened for the vendors too, waiting to run downstairs with her purse. Some in the building kept a basket and rope ready by their window, to lower with money and haul back up with their change and their potatoes, onions, mutton, bread, whatever they needed. Roxana did not use the system, too public for her liking. As Yezid joked, this now was real window shopping, by keeping an eye on the basket on a rope commerce, you could tell who was eating what on any given day. Yezad was always laughing and joking in the morning, chatting. With the boys, telling them little stories. Just yesterday he'd told. Then the one about old Mr. Engineer, who had lived all his life in. Pleasant Villa, and had died recently. Remember his special rope trick, Roxy? She nodded, while Jangir and Murad pleaded to hear it. The bath water had not reached a boil, so Yezad narrated Mr. Engineer's escapade from many years ago, when he had fallen on hard times, every morning, when it was time for the Eggman to arrive, Mr. Engineer would wait by his second-story window. From the balcony above him, the third ore basket would hurtle towards the pavement, then ascend slowly with its fragile cargo. As it was rising past Mr. Engineer's window, an unseen hand would emerge, snatch an egg, and carry it out to the kitchen for breakfast. When the basket reached its destination, they would shout from the third ore at the Eggman below, Hi to Muaidavala. Dozen means twelve, not eleven. The Eggman would stand RM for a while, argue, then capitulate and send up one. More egg. One morning, the culprit was Nally observed with his hand in the basket. Caught egg-handed, said Yezid, and the upstairs neighbors confronted Mr. Engineer with reluctance, embarrassed by the whole business. Unabashed, Mr. Engineer said, who am I to reject what God sends oding to my window? Jangir and Murad laughed loudest at this point in the story, laughter led with admiration and fellow feeling, while their father concluded ever since, the entire building has called it Mr. Engineer's famous rope trick. Murad said it reminded him of another story that Daddy had told them, about the king named Sisyphus who was punished in Hades. I think Mr. Engineer is like Sisyphus. How challenged his brother. Mr. Engineer didn't have to push a big rock up the hill, over and over. It feels like that, insisted Murad, but uncertain how to explain his feeling. The basket going down every day, then going up, and... Poor Mr. Engineer with no money, standing there to steal his egg. It's just like a punishment, day after day. It's sad. I know what you mean, said his father. If you think about it, in a way we are all like Sisyphus. There was silence while they thought about it. Then Jangir, nodding gravely, said he understood. It's like homework. Every day I niche my lessons, and next day there is more homework. It never ends. They laughed. But Mr. Engineer's story has a happy ending, said Yezid. A few days after he was caught, his doorbell rang in the morning, and when he opened, no one was there. Only a brown paper bag upon the oar. Inside it, one egg. This kindness happened twice a week, and continued till the day he died. Why only twice a week, asked Murad. Why not one egg every day? Who knows, said Yezid. Roxana, with a meaningful look in his direction, said whoever it was probably didn't want to give the old man high cholesterol. Yazad pretended not to hear. Meanwhile, the boys started a list of food they wished would oat past their window, muenes, porridge, kippers, scones, steak and kidney pie, potted meat, dumplings. Their father said if they ever tasted this insipid foreign stew instead of merely reading about it in those blighted blighten books, they would realize how amazing was their mother's curry rice and kitri sauce and pumpkin biryani and donsak. What they needed was an Indian blighten to fascinate them with their own reality. Then the announcer on the radio said it was time for one of yesteryear's golden hits, and Engelbert Humperdinck came on. Yezid and the boys sang along with the refrain, just three little words, I love you. Roxana smiled, waiting till the song ended before sending Murad and Jangir O to get ready for school. But that was yesterday morning. And how things had changed this afternoon, she thought, pouring a cup for herself, leaving the kettle on the stove. 
Later, around six, she would boil fresh water for Yezid's tea. His evening cup was not at all like the morning. In the evening she saw the bruises enacted by the working day. The love she felt for him then was like a hurt, as he told her about the clients he had had to deal with, obnoxious because they controlled large budgets and knew they could be rude with impunity, invariably angling for kickbacks from the money they spent to purchase sports equipment for the schools or colleges or corporations they represented. And he had to swallow his disgust, let them know tactfully that the proprietor, Mr. Kapoor, did not allow it. Anger and frustration would LL his face as he sipped the tea. Sometimes he drank from the cup, more often he poured a little in the saucer and stared into it, as though the answers he needed lay in its unfathomable depths. She was afraid to touch him with words, silence was all he could bear. And she understood, in some small way, what it was to be him who tried so hard for the family he loved. All she could do was wait for night to fall and restore him in the alembic of sleep. So in the morning he was ready again, armed with optimism. She watched him return to the fray, knowing how it would end in the evening, and knowing that he knew it too, and yet he persevered. Then she felt her husband was as brave and strong as any Rustam or Saurabh, her hero, whose mundane exploits deserved to be recorded in his very own Shanama, his Yezidnama, and she thanked fate, God, the fortune, whoever was in charge. She feared about how Papa's arrival would have ECT there. Morning. No matter what, she had to preserve its rhythm for. Yezad. Yes, she was determined, not a hair of the routine that gave him so much joy would be allowed to change. Halfway through Roxana's second cup, Jangir and Nariman awoke, roused by Murad's doorbell. She opened the door and squeezed his arm as he rushed past, not risking a review by detaining him for a hug. He hung his school bag under the desk and went to the front room. Hi, Grandpa, he said, as though to ND him lying on the settee was quite normal. Don't you want to know why he's here? He listened while she told about the accident and thought a bit. Since Grandpa is visiting, I'll sleep on the balcony, Jangir can have the cot. No, I'll sleep on the balcony, said his brother. What, said Nariman? Both of you want to eat the room? Do I smell so bad? They protested it wasn't that, sleeping on the balcony was an adventure for them, where they could see the stars and the clouds. We'll decide after Daddy comes home, said Roxana, unwrapping the bedpan and urinal. She examined them and took them to wash. People have diuret standards of cleanliness, she thought, fuming anew at Jal and Kumi. What are those, asked Jangir, as his mother returned and slipped the utensils under the settee. They are for Grandpa. For what? That's his susu bottle, pointed Murad, and that's for number two. Jangir made a skeptical face. What's it really for, Mummy? What Murad said. Grandpa cannot walk to the toilet. Jangir made another face and said she, but it was more a matter of form than actual revulsion. At 6.30, the boys heard their father at the door and raced to open it. Daddy. Can I make a tent and sleep on the balcony? shouted Jangir before Murad could turn the latch. No, Daddy, it was my idea, you can ask Mummy. The excited reception pleased Yezad. At least let me put a foot inside. Say hi to your tired father before making demands. Hi, they said in unison. Can I sleep on the balcony? He shut the door, sliding home the security bolt. Roxy, what's this crazy plan your sons have? He entered the front room and stopped. Hello? Chief? Is that you? He puzzled about it, came to visit, of course, but all by himself? And why lie on the settee? Feeling unwell, maybe. The plaster cast that would have oh aired a hint was concealed by the sheet. Not to seem taken aback, he smiled and went to shake hands while Jangir insisted that since Grandpa was in his bed, he should be the one to get the balcony. Murad argued that he was older, he would be safer there, Jangir might get up in the night and fall over the railing. Quiet, or I'll give you each a big demelo, said their mother. Balcony, balcony, balcony. Is that all? Before I can even tell Daddy about Grandpa? Drying her hands upon her skirt, she approached the settee. You won't believe it, Yezed, when you hear how badly Jal and Kumi have behaved. They tried their best, my dear, said Nariman softly. Don't be angry with your brother and sister. Half-brother and half-sister, Papa, let's be accurate. You never thought this way when you were children, he said sadly. And they never acted this way. Will someone please tell me what happened? She related the events of the morning and the past week. Yezid's head was shaking when she nished. I must say, Chief, I have to agree those two have behaved badly. I'd use much stronger words. Turning up like thieves, leaving you in the ambulance, blackmailing Roxana. They couldn't cope, said Nariman. This was a way out. For successful dumping, advance notice is unadvisable. Remember that, both of you, when you want to return me to Chateau Felicity. That's not funny, Papa. Where's their sense of decency? I wonder what would happen if you demanded to go back, said Yezid. It's your home, after all. You should put your foot down. Chief, just to see what they do. If I could put my foot down, everything would be any, said Nariman with a wry smile. How can you force people? Can caring and concern be made compulsory? Either it resides in the heart, or nowhere. Still, it's infuriating, they've pushed you out of your comfortable at into this cramped little space. Nariman shook his head. That huge it is empty as a Himalayan cave for me, this feels like a palace. But it will be decult for you. You're welcome to stay, chief, your house, after all. Nariman turned his face away. Never say that, please. Notwithstanding my barging in today, this ad is yours and Roxana's. Your wedding gift. It ill behooves anyone to suggest, after 15 years, that I am attempting to commandeer these premises. 
The stee and formal turn of Nariman's diction told Yezid he had o-ended him. Sorry, chief, didn't mean that. We'll manage any, papa, said Roxana. Three weeks will why before we know it. Exactly, said Yezid. And Murad and Jangir will help there. Mother with the extra work. You promise, boys? We'll soon have the chief good as new. Jangir pulled the urinal and bedpan out from under the cot. That's grandpa's susu bottle, he explained to his father, and that's for Kaka. Don't touch those things, said Yezid, suddenly angry. Wash your hands at once. With Roxana's and Nariman's worried eyes following him, he stalked out to the balcony where he stood till she announced dinner was ready. Jangir claimed he was expert now at feeding grandpa and helped him with the French beans. Yezid remarked that the chief not only had his private nursing home but also his own butler, what more could he want? Nariman wondered if resentment was concealed behind the words. I'm truly blessed to have such a family. Makes up for all other disciencies. We should decide about the bedding, said Roxana. The kitchen was not an option, she felt. Mice and cockroaches persisted despite the poison she spread regularly. The passage between kitchen and WC would be unhygienic. And the ore near the front door had a perpetual damp patch whose origins had yet to be traced. Which left the balcony. Yippee, said Jangir. Simply smashing. I'll make a tent and have a midnight feast in it. Sorry, said Murad, squadron leader Bigglesworth needs it for a base to conduct secret operations. Only one way to settle this, said Yezid. You'll have to share. Grandpa is here for three weeks, let's say twenty days. So ten days each. Their father tossed a coin to see who would be RST Murad called Tails and won. The two thin mattresses on the cot parted. Company, one remained behind for Jangir, the other went. Outside, upon a plastic sheet. Hope it rains heavily, said Murad. It will be just like the Biggie's adventure when his hurricane crash landed in Sumatra in the middle of a storm. Silly boy, scolded his mother. Pray to God it remains dry. What will we do if your mattress is soaked? Once again your medicine bottles that we can't afford will rule my life. Yezad tried to placate her fears, there was very little chance of rain tonight, tomorrow he would rig something up on the balcony for protection. But she was not willing to take the risk. It's only the beginning of September. If Murad falls sick it will be impossible for me, now that I have Papa to look after. She threatened to sleep on the balcony herself if it wasn't 100% rainproof. Now Murad worried his adventure was about to slip out of his grasp. It's okay, mummy, he reassured her. Daddy and I will dress the balcony in a raincoat and gumboots and cap. Rummaging among the shelves outside the kitchen, they found two small plastic sheets, enough to cover the spaces in the wrought iron railings, but nothing large enough to make a roof. Ask Vili, suggested Yezid to Roxana. She might lend us a tarpaulin or something. You go. I can't stand her, with her dear and darling, and her gambling. Vili Cardmaster, or the Matka Queen, as Yezid called her, was about his age, and lived with her mother in the next at. She had taken to professing preference for her single state, declaring she had no use for a groaning moaning fellow, keeping her up all night with his demands. Sometimes, though, she looked wistfully at men, as though sizing them up for herself. Her days were occupied with housework and caring for her. Ailing mother, who had shrunk to the size of a six-year-old. Vili was able to lift her without much eort as she took her from the bed to the bathroom, and to her easy chair on the balcony, or to the dining table, carrying her around like a wrinkled doll. Any spare time that Vili squeezed out of her day was devoted to analyzing dreams. She assigned numeric values to objects and events from a dream, which were then used to play matka. The illegal numbers game was the thread upon which the beads of her hours were strung. She interrogated friends, neighbors, neighbors' servants, and those who shared their dreams were rewarded with the fruits of her analysis. She had a little matka utter almost every day, placing the bets when she went for her daily shopping to the bunya, who was also a bookie. Hello, Yazaji, she exclaimed, delighted to have a visitor. She used the Hanori C. Su X with every male, regardless of age or station. Sorry to bother you, Vili. What use are neighbors if you can't bother them? Come in, my. Dear, bother me all you want. He followed her smelly housecoat pure inside. The full-length garment, loose and buttoned along the front, disguised her form esciently. She wore it from one bath to the next, which meant three or four days. She slept in it, cooked in it, and conducted her daily shopping in it, the last with a signy camp modi cat iron. She wrapped a sari over the housecoat, draping it rather uniquely, half a dozen safety pins held it in place, for there was no petticoat waistband into which it could be tucked. She called the housecoat her all-purpose gown. He realized why the erding depressed him, it was the gulf between her coquettish words and slovenly appearance. Without too many details he explained why he had come, but Vili had seen the ambulance in the morning and heard the row. I understand, Yazaji, she said with a wink. In-law troubles make the strongest into helpless kittens. Come, let's see what we can end. She led the way, expressing regret for Nariman's predicament. His tragic life, she called it, and recounted some of the sordid details. Her familiarity with the facts did not surprise Yezid, there were many in the Parsi community who could recall the scandal with Vili's mix of sympathy and satisfaction. She stopped before an old dresser, crammed with odds and ends. Make yourself at home, my darling, look freely through these drawers. Noticing his reluctance, she knelt to help him get started. By the way, I have a strong matka number for tonight. A dream so powerful, so numerically forceful I haven't had in months. Good luck, Vili, hope you crack it. Despite his lack of curiosity, she dramatically lowered her voice to preserve the dream's numinous power and continued, with reverent cadence, a cat is what I saw. A cat beside a large saucer of milk. 
And it discussed numbers with you? With a pitying smile, she pulled things out of the drawers for his inspection. The message of cat and saucer was so strong, Yazaji. There was no need for discussion. So the two of you communicated by telepathy? Vili shook her head. The cat was sitting up straight, looking at me. Her head and body formed a perfect eight. And on her left side, the saucer of milk, round, like a zero. So tomorrow's number is 80. He was not through with teasing. But, Vili, did you dream in English or Gujarati? I'm not sure. What's the diorance? Huge diorance. Gujarati number eight inch, he drew it in the air with his inger, does not look like a cat sitting up straight. Big joker you are, Yazaji. She laughed, but the seed of doubt was planted. They found some squares of oilskin and a four by six section of canvas, not so scient to roof the balcony. Then, from the last drawer, he pulled out a large leathery sheet that was packed inside a shopping bag. What's this? Oh, the old tablecloth. For our family dining table. Must be huge. It is. It was. So huge, sixteen could sit comfortably. They each took hold of an end, the layers, stuck together. Separated with a sound like fabric rending. As the dark green scene unfolded, Vili let her memories unfold with it. Such happy times, Yazaji, we had around this tablecloth. Every Sunday afternoon, the whole family together, for Donsak lunch. Bavaji was fanatic about it, curry rice okay for Saturday, but try to cook anything except Donsak on Sunday and heaven help you. So Meiji never argued. And at one o'clock uncles, aunties, cousins would arrive and start chattering as though we hadn't met for months. Yazid thought about the balcony waiting to be XED, but he did not have the heart to interrupt. Vili's face was aglow with happiness. Always Bavaji made me sit at his right hand, and my brother, Dolly, at his left. And for Sunday lunch the Rexine tablecloth was topped with another, of Belgian lace. Bavaji did not allow Nick. Knacks or vases upon it, saying it was a crime to cover up a work of art. How lovely those days were, Yazaji. Wait a minute, let me show you something. She returned with a framed photograph, a family of four, posed formally at one end of a long dining table. Mother, father, two well-behaved children, the boy scrubbed and shining in short trousers, shirt, and tie, the little girl in her ribbon-bedecked frock of pink organza. My seventh birthday, which fell on a Sunday. Very special. She sighed. Why is it that when we grow up, suddenly the happy days are behind us? Yezed had no answer. What happened to that dining table? My brother took it to his new at when he got married. Does he have big Sunday lunches, family tradition? Vili twisted her mouth in answer. He destroyed the table. It wouldn't tee through his front door, so he got a carpenter to turn it into a sectional table. God knows what jungly would he used for. Framing, but in two years it was eaten to bits by white ants. She stroked the cloth and began folding. Yes, it helped, wondering about the workings of a fate that had transformed Vili from the sweet little pink-frocked girl, sitting at her father's right hand for Sunday Donsack, to the dream-obsessed, matcabasotted woman with a rancid smell. What cruel trajectory had led from there to here? She did not replace the tablecloth in its bag. I'm sure this will be large enough to cover the balcony. Yezad was startled. Don't you want to save such an important memento? Memento fomento I don't believe in. A big tablecloth without a big table, without guests to sit and laugh and talk, is no use. Cover the balcony before your little boy catches a chill. Thanks, Vili. She pushed the odds and ends back into the drawers and slammed them shut. You know, Yazaji, you're right. If my dream was in Gujarati, I'd use a diorent method, the sound of the word. Cat would become Balari, bay number for Balari. Combined with zero for saucer, I should bet twenty. And you too, my dear, put some money on twenty and eighty, safe in both languages. You'll win enough to build a puck of room on your balcony. He said no need, he wanted to keep it as a balcony, the situation was temporary. That means nothing, said Vili, seeing him to the door. Everything is temporary, Yazaji. Life itself is temporary. Wasn't it typical of that woman, said Roxana, to keep a man chatting for as long as possible with her dear darling nonsense. And when she heard that Vili had shown him a photo, she asked what kind of new perversion was that woman up to, wasn't Matka enough for her? It was a family photo, when she was seven, said Yezid, which made Roxana feel foolish and then guilty about taking the tablecloth, as he told the story behind it, repeating Vili's sad remembrances. You know, she's not a bad person. Just a little weird. And she oh aired to get your shopping from the bunya, she goes every morning. He spread the rec scene on the balcony and made holes at suitable distances along the edges, feeling a twinge at each perforation. He would buy metal eyelets tomorrow at the Bora's hardware shop, reinforce the raw punctures, make it strong as tarpaulin. With short lengths of rope through each hole, he fastened the sheet to the balcony railing. Murad began equipping his Rexine tent for the night. He took his toy binoculars, compass, and weapons, a paper knife and water pistol. He wanted to keep a candle and matches as well in his emergency hideout, deep in the darkest recesses of the Sumatran jungle, but his mother refused. Mummy is right, said Yezad. It won't be very pleasant if you burn down Pleasant Villa. Ha, ha, very funny. Mummy always imagines horrible things. Speaking of imagining, Chief, what's this about being depressed? Are Jal and Kumi imagining it? I can't believe it of a philosopher like you. Depression is a red herring, said Nariman. I think a lot about the past, it's true. But at my age, the past is more present than the here and now. And there is not much percentage in the future. You've got many years left with us, Papa. I wonder why Dr. Terrapur thought it was depression, said Yezid. 
The quack misdiagnosed based on what Kumi and Zhao said. He has yet to learn not everything can be explained clinically. The heart has its reasons which reason knows nothing of. That's lovely, said Roxana. Shakespeare? Pascal. She repeated the words to herself, silently, the heart has its. Reasons. Lying on his cot, Jangir listened, attentive to the adult's conversation, wondering what depression felt like. Was it the sad feeling when it kept raining for many days? He watched, envious, as Murad prepared for his night on the balcony. Then he heard Grandpa ask in a timid voice for the susu bottle. I'll get it for you, he said, jumping over the cot. His father crossed the room in two violent strides and stood in his path. What did I say about that bottle? Jangir froze. He thought his father was going to hit him. He sounded angriest when his voice was so scarily quiet. Answer me. What did I tell you? Cowering, he replied, not to touch those things. So why did you try to get it? I forgot, he said, his voice tiny. I wanted to help. Next moment the anger disappeared, and his father's hand was on his shoulder. You don't have to help with this, Jihangla. His father nudged him towards the cot. He watched his mother. Pick up the susu bottle. She lifted the sheet and put Grandpa's. Susodi into it. It was small, not much bigger than his. But Grandpa's balls were huge. Like onions in a sock, even bigger than. Daddy's, which he had seen many times when Daddy came out of the bathroom and took the towel to put on his clothes. His own were like little marbles. He wondered if the size and weight of Grandpa's made it uncomfortable. Lie down, Jihangla, said Daddy. You don't have to look at everything. Good night. Then Mummy brought the basin for Grandpa to gargle and clean his mouth before going to sleep. He made that funny move with his jaw to push out his teeth. They slid into the glass, into their watery bed, before Jangir closed his eyes. With her head next to Yezid's on the pillow, Roxana thanked him for being so understanding. He suggested it might be best to hire a hospital ayah, running herself ragged was not the answer. We'll make Jal and Kumi pay the cost. Tell them it's our condition for accommodating Papa. After the way they behaved, I don't want a thing from them. I don't want to see their faces for three weeks, till Papa is on his feet. She assured him it wouldn't be decult, with a little patience and understanding. Then she described how bad Papa smelled when he'd arrived. All it took was a napkin and water, and talcum, but Jal and Kumi hadn't bothered. And you saw the stubble on his poor face, they packed his razor in the bag. As if he can do it himself. We'll call a barber. But three weeks, and that's it. I will accept no excuses from those two rascals. Oh, I'm not going to let them push Papa from his house for longer than that. Just watch me, I'll straighten them out. She came closer, hugged him, and kissed the ear into which she'd been whispering, nibbling it. He sighed. His ingers reached for the hem of her nightdress and pulled it up around her hips as she raised her bottom slightly. His hand moved under the soft fabric. She said better wait a little, the boys were asleep, but she was not. Sure about Papa. Nariman opened his eyes and wished Lucy's large, sad eyes would. Stop haunting him. Turning his head, he looked for the familiar. Bars on his window, and saw his grandson's cot instead. He was. Not in Chateau Felicity. He must stay quiet tonight, muzzle his. Memories, must not disturb Roxana and Yezid, and the children. Sleeping close by. Drowsy from the painkiller, he drifted on a cloud resembling. Slumber. Among the murmurs from the back room, the word Aya. Caught his ear. And memory began its torments again. Lucy. Accepting employment as an Aya in Chateau Felicity, to be. Closer to him, she'd said. And the work was no hardship, she. Assured him, it was a great comfort to live and sleep in the same. Building. Even before she became a servant, heartache had etched lines of fatigue on her face, making it gaunt. Domestic drudgery was now worsening it. How outrageous, he thought, that she would do this to herself, go to such absurd lengths just to retaliate, to make his life miserable because he had refused to meet her on the footpath anymore. Her employers were the ground or Arjani's. They knew who she was, they had often seen Lucy with him. The ground or Gestapo, he would joke with Lucy during the years when they were still going out, for Mr. and Mrs. Arjani were always at their window, keeping an eye on the comings and goings in Chateau Felicity. And later, they would watch her on those evenings when she stood like a lost child on the pavement, staring up at his window. But hiring her as an ayah for their grandchildren, he realized, was an act of vengeance. Years earlier, around the time he had met Lucy, Mr. Arjani had been sued by Nariman's father for libel, and this was the reprisal, it became clear now. Such a monumental waste of time and energy the lawsuit had been, he thought, as he remembered the religious controversy that had fueled the feud. A priest had performed a navjot ceremony for the son of a Parsi mother and non-Parsi father, an absolute taboo for the conservative factions. The event had ignited one of those periods of debate and polemics and bickering that infected the reformists and the orthodox from time to time, like the U. So his father, famous for his letters to the editor, wrote one condemning the priest, that for the misguided duster in question, the sacred investiture ceremony of Sudra and Kusti had no more signy cants than tying an ordinary string around one's waist, given the cavalier way he was bestowing it on all and sundry, that it was. Renegades like him who would destroy this 3,000-year-old religion, that Zoroastrianism had survived many setbacks in its venerable history, but what the Arab armies had failed to achieve in AD 652, priests like him would accomplish, the purity of this unique and ancient Persian community, the very plinth and foundation of its survival, was being compromised. 
Ignorance may be bliss, he wrote, however, the ignorance of mischief-making priests was anything but, it was poison for the Parsi community. Though the bombastic tone of his father's rhetoric was amusing, it had left Nariman shaking his head in despair. The Jammy Jamshet dedicated a special box each morning to the controversy. And each morning his father sat back and enjoyed the letters, for and against, instigated by his missive, his face lighting up with satisfaction when he opened the paper over breakfast and read choice bits aloud to his family. Invariably, his father would end a way to connect the controversy with Lucy. He would cite examples in it to illustrate why intermarriage was forbidden. Extracts from the correspondence would be presented as unshakable arguments for prohibiting relationships between Parsi and non-Parsi. Nariman tried to use the openings O aired by the breakfast discourses. He pleaded with his father to invite Lucy to lunch or tea, talk to her before making his mind up. But his father refused, it would be unfair, he said, to raise the poor girl's hopes. Sometimes, his mother suggested timidly that there was no harm in ding out what kind of person she was. His father said she might be a wonderful person, as gracious and charming as the Queen of England, but she was still unsuitable for his son because she was not a Zoroastrian, case closed. How naive, to have kept hoping his father would change his mind, or that a passive stance would avoid unpleasantness, improve the chances for Lucy and himself. He had underestimated his father's stamina, his willingness to trade familial happiness for narrow beliefs. Then Mr. Arjani's scathing letter appeared in the newspaper, and his father's morning entertainment ended abruptly. Coming from the ground or neighbor, it felt like an attack from a traitor in his own camp. And though he had decided at the outset that he would restrict himself to just one letter, taking the high road thereafter and ignoring the yip-yap of the rabble, he lifted his pen to re a second salvo. He called Mr. Arjani a prime example of the substandard mind whose cogitations were clearly worthless, unable to grasp the simplest tenets of the religion and the supreme signicants of the Navjot. Mr. Arjani's views, he wrote, did not deserve the dignity of debate. Mr. Arjani joined the battle with vigor. The exchange became ever more vitriolic, ending with the letter that took them to court. In it, Mr. Vakil was accused of being a rabid racist who, in his maniacal quest for purity, wouldn't think twice about eliminating the spouses and oh, spring of intermarriage. His father was advised by his Sunday evening group that it was time to sue for defamation of character. Mr. Arjani was oh aired the chance to withdraw his statements and apologize. He refused. A group of reformists nanced the defense and, though they lost, were pleased with the ensuing publicity. His father gave a party to celebrate the victory. The Sunday evening group presented him with the page from the Jammy Jamshet, framed behind glass. Featuring the full retraction and apology. They were behaving as though they'd won a cricket match, thought Nariman. For them, the ruling was a validation of their beliefs rather than a technicality of libel law. While the case was before the court, his emotions had been mixed. He didn't want his father to lose, at the same time, he had hoped that if those bigoted ideas were scrutinized in public, his father might recognize them for what they were. But there had been no such redemption. And now, ten years later, with his parents dead, he had to watch Lucy become the instrument of the Arjani's confused vengeance. Mr. Arjani bragged to everyone in Chateau Felicity, hiring Marasbin Vakil's son's girlfriend as an ayah was at any revenge. To see the drama that Professor Vakil and Lucy put on was Aris de class fun. Poetic justice, he said, far superior to the justice of law courts. If only Mr. Arjani had thought a little. If only he'd realized that his late father, with his narrow views, would have agreed with his old enemy that Lucy was better. Suited to be an ayah than his daughter-in-law anyway. But Lucy's decision abrogasted Nariman. He asked her if she was doing it for the money. He would help her, no need to humiliate herself he would ND her an OCE job. Smiling, she shook her head. Don't you understand why I am here? You're on the third oar, I am on the ground oar, and it comforts me. He warned her that, for all the good that would do, they might as well be in Diorent cities, he was going to keep his word, he would not see her anymore. You're wasting your time, slaving for a pittance. She smiled. I never even noticed the work. And the three children are very sweet. You know how much I love children. Remember the plans we made, Nari? Six little ones we wanted, and the names we picked, please, Lucy, don't do this to me, he walked away in anger. But then, every morning, as he left for work, he saw her take the three Arjani. Children to school. He heard Mr. Arjani shouting instructions to her from the window, to carry the children's school bags, because the books were too heavy for their little shoulders. I don't want my grandchildren deformed by humps, he said. Nariman watched Lucy struggle with the three bags. Not many mornings passed before he went to relieve her of their weight, walking with her to the children's school. At noon, Lucy had to deliver the children's lunches. Depending on his lecture schedule, he would be there to help with the hot TIN boxes and the basket of crockery and the thermoses led with cold drinks. Mr. Arjani boasted that he now had two servants for the price of one. Nariman, his conscience heavy, knew his wife was watching it all from upstairs. He knew that what he was doing was utterly unfair to Yasmin. When he returned from work, he found Jal and Kumi beside their mother, trying to console her. They would not look at him. They no longer came to wish him good night before going to bed. And Yasmin asked what she had done to deserve such treatment. Why was he? Torturing her? Why had he married her if he cared so much for Lucy? I care for her only as a human being, to make her end her madness. You said you had ended it, that time when she used to stare at our window in the evening. Why should I believe you now? Please understand, without speaking to her, how will I convince her to give up this awkward situation? She's not going to listen. Don't you see she's making a fool of you? Trying to make you feel guilty? 
Perhaps I am, he said, and wished he hadn't, for Yasmin began to lose her temper. Forget about me. You've already ruined my life. Think of yourself, how it hurts your reputation at university, and how it will at ECT the way people talk about our little Roxana. She will carry her father's shame. There is nothing shameful about my behavior, he said quietly. I consider it an honorable way of conducting myself, under the circumstances. A strange idea of honor. First you marry me, then throw me aside. Now you snee like a dog after her. And what about her family, why are they letting her abuse herself this way? Her family has disowned her, you know that. After enduring the Morty cation for months, Yasmin issued an ultimatum, she would take Roxana and leave if he did not stop being the Aya's assistant. He had one week to decide. What good will it do, he tried to reason. There will be hardship for you and our child. You have the gall to talk about hardship? What do I have now? Comfort and happiness? As the week drew to a close, he requested her not to make a bad situation worse. She said he'd regret the day he was born if he didn't heed her warning. She had had enough, she was going to stand up for her rights, if not as wife then at least as mother. You can't go, he pleaded, a note of hysteria entering his voice for the RST time. I need my darling Roxana, you will not take her from me. Roxana and Yezid stood in the dark, peering into the front room. It had distinctly sounded like Papa was calling her. Must have had a dream, said Yezad. They waited a few moments, then went back to bed, agreeing. Not to mention it in the morning. It would only make him feel. Foolish. Better to keep his spirits up. Whatever was bothering him. Would recede of its own accord, 